Last Sunday, we started a series, it's a two-week series called Out of the Cave, where we're addressing the issue of depression. And I said it last week, and I need to say it again. From the beginning, let me just remind you, I am not a psychologist, I am not a counselor, I'm a pastor. And I can tell you what the scripture says. And I can tell you that there is hope. Another pastor, Chris Hodges, wrote an incredible book called Out of the Cave. And last Sunday's message and today's message come straight from this book. Like, I'm just being upfront and telling you, this is not my material, it's Pastor Chris Hodges. And I encourage you to get this book. Um, it's a great book. I have, I think, one copy left if you want a copy. First one to say, hey, I want that copy, you can, you can have it. Um, but I need you to understand, depression is very real. Mental illness is real. Depression has become the number one health problem in our world today. And anything that affects people on such a huge scale as this, we have to understand God cares and God has an answer. Now, please know, there are very real biological contributions to depression and anxiety. But if we allow biology to become the whole picture, we miss the real solution. And we talked about it last week that sometimes it's not biological that's causing our depression. Sometimes it's our lifestyle. Sometimes I am pushing myself into a cave of depression. And if you're pushing yourself into a cave of depression, there's hope. You can get out. But sometimes you need someone to take you by the hand and help you get out. And that's what the Lord wants to do. So last week we looked at how we get into the cave of depression. Today we're going to step into the light and come out of the cave. And so let's pick up in the story where we left off. We're looking at the life of Elijah and there's no way you can cover the life of Elijah in two weeks. But if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah has some great spiritual victories. He, uh, I always call it the showdown at Mount Carmel. He has this great victory where he defeats the prophets of Baal and Asera. And in fact, he has them taken down to a valley and has them all slaughtered after he proves that our God is God. And then scripture says that Elijah climbed the top of Mount Carmel, which I'm like, that's a feat in itself. I, I didn't realize that till this morning I was going over the text, and I was like, oh my goodness, Elijah climbed back to the top of that mountain, and he sat there, and he began to look, because he had called a drought. The Lord told Elijah he could call a drought for three years it hadn't rained, and Elijah sent his servant to look for a cloud, and Scripture says that seven times the servant went back, and he never saw anything, but the seventh time the servant said, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah sent word to King Ahab. He said, get ready, there's a sound of rain. And scripture says that the Lord anointed Elijah and he outran King Ahab's chariot and got to the city before he did. Which I'm like, that's a huge miracle in itself. And then you get to 1 Kings 19 where we started last week in verse 1. As Ahab got home, Jezebel told, uh, he told Jezebel, his wife, everything that Elijah had done, including how he killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. She said, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. This is the equivalent to somebody putting a post on your social media page, how we let people's comments just tear us down. And you, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who do social media, it's so easy to put all this weight on some comment that somebody made. And that's what Elijah did. Is he put too much weight on Jezebel's comment. In verse 4 it says in 1 Kings 19, Elijah went, uh, verse 3, he was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. And then verse 5 is what we're picking up today. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some, baked, some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, for the journey ahead is going to be too much. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Here's what I want you to understand. If you're in a cave of depression, to leave the dark cave of depression... You have to be willing to get up and get out of the cave. All right, think about that. Because if you're in a cave of depression, oh, poor me and my life's so bad, and sometimes we are in this cave, and sometimes we walked ourselves into this cave, and the solution is for us to get up and to walk ourselves out of the cave. But you've got to be willing to take a step. But we say, well, the Lord's going to make a way. 
do you know how many times in our life the Lord makes a way and he wants us to take a step and we don't want to move? We're like, Lord, show me the way. And the Lord's like, take a step, take a step, take a step. You've got to be willing to move and get out of the cave. You've got to come to the conclusion in your heart, in your mind, I'm not staying in this cave any longer. I'm getting out of this cave of depression. Amen? So let me show you five steps. Last week we looked at six things that push us into the cave of depression. Today we're going to take five steps to get out. Step number one, step into a needed recovery. Step into a needed recovery. In other words, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Now I know it's a Sunday after Thanksgiving. Don't, don't, don't shoot me those glares when I say this, but there's something about eating right that is good for our body. There is. Like, I'm, I'm, I love junk food. I do. I, I love uh, all kinds of potato chips. I was just, like, going to start naming names, but I don't want to start a revival because, like, I mean, you know, like, I love, like, nacho cheese Doritos. Can I get an amen? And I even like Cool Ranch, you know, and I like Cheetos. And like my dad said the other day, Cheetos out of the freezer are the best. Like, put that bag in the freezer, get them cold, eat those crunchy Cheetos. Ooh, those are so good. And just honor, I love junk food, but here's what I notice: When I listen to those who care about me, my wife, and she says, hey, quit eating that junk food and have some carrots. I'm, in my mind, I'm like, man, carrots are not chips. I know they crunch, but it's just not the same. But you know what I notice is when I eat, make healthier choices, I feel better. There's something about the way we eat, the things we put into our body that helps us feel better. And sometimes our depression, our, our lingering in the cave is because we're not taking care of our bodies. We're not eating the right things. And notice that Elijah had a physical need and God addressed his physical need before he addressed his spiritual need. Before the angel took Elijah on this spiritual journey, he focused on Elijah's health. Elijah wasn't healthy enough to make the journey. And for some, you're in this cave of depression and you're not healthy enough to get out of the cave. You've got to focus on your physical body. You've got to take care of you. So Elijah slept. Can I get an Amen. He slept. Look, look at that. Look, look what he did. He slept. He ate. He drank water and he slept some more. That's so good, isn't it? Let me tell you that again. He slept. He ate. He drank water and he slept some more. And verse 8 says, He was strengthened by the food. He was strengthened by the food. So if you're in a cave of depression, get yourself in shape physically. Watch your diet. Get more sleep. Get more sleep. You, your body tells you when you didn't have enough sleep. Listen to your body. I, I'm sorry, but I have to tell you, um, exercise. <laughs> exercise. Get up and move around a little bit. I hate exercising. I hate getting up early and going to work out. But you know what? Every day I do, I'm like, man, I just feel good today. Like, I have energy today. And then I'm like, I need a nap today because I got up early and worked out. And I feel like if you get up early and work out, you earn that nap in the middle of the afternoon. You do, right? Sometimes I disguise my nap as prayer. I'll just kind of sit at my desk like this because I'm afraid someone's going to walk by and see me. And I just don't want them to know I'm asleep. Secrets out. Sometimes I'm sleeping, sometimes I'm praying. But you know what else we need? We need sunlight. We need sunlight. There, there are nutrients in the sun, and I don't have time to, I don't understand all that, but there's something about our body getting in the sun that it lifts our spirit. It helps us to realize we need to be healthy. Last week we looked at a scripture that Solomon wrote, Ecclesiastes 4, 6. Listen to what he said. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Listen, just because you can fill both hands doesn't mean you need to fill both hands. Just because you have the ability to work 80, 90, 100 hours a week doesn't mean you need to do that. Like God didn't create us to just keep going and going and going and going. Listen, we have to take control of our schedules. We have to slow down a little bit. It's okay to not run full speed every day. Here's what I want you to understand. If you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. If you don't make priorities and say, you know what, I'm going to do this, this is a priority, someone else will fill that spot. I, I did something this summer um, during the month of July. There was no getting up to go drive a school bus or anything. And so I started coming to the church 
at 8 o'clock to pray, and I, and I enjoyed it. I loved spending that hour in prayer. So I said, you know what? School's starting. I'm putting this on my calendar. And on my calendar, I can show you every day it says 8 o'clock prayer. And every day at 8 o'clock, I'm right here in this room spending time with God. Sometimes I'll go outside. But I learned, here's what I figured out. If I don't prioritize my time with God, someone else will take this space. And so at 8 o'clock, I come here and pray. I don't do meetings. I don't do phone calls. I don't do text messages. I don't check emails. I'm here spending time with the Lord. You're saying, well, that's nice. You work at the church. Yes, I do, but you can do it as well. You can find a time that works best for you. Listen to what Moses wrote in Psalm 90, verse 12. He said, teach us to realize the brevity of life so we may grow in wisdom. Another translation says, teach us to number our days. We only have so many days. We only have so much time in those days. We've got to prioritize our schedule or someone else will. Listen, sometimes we have to prioritize replenishing our bodies by getting rest. Let me ask you, does anybody feel guilty when you rest? Yeah, I do. Can I, can I tell you a secret this week? I finished my sermon, I finished my notes Wednesday morning, and I went home and I didn't look at them again until this morning. And this morning I was in my office and I was like, Lord, forgive me for not looking at my notes for the last three days. And I was like, wait a minute. That's silly. I don't have to apologize to the Lord for taking three days off. I say, well, it must be nice to get three days off. Thanksgiving, the day after, and yesterday was Saturday. And I didn't do anything ministry-related. I just enjoyed time with my family. A couple of those days, I pulled an all-day. I didn't even take a nap. I just stayed awake all day. Some of those days, I took my naps. Listen, we should not feel guilty when we take time to replenish our lives. You shouldn't feel guilty about structuring your schedule to make things a priority, like your exercise, eating well, your time with the Lord, your rest. We need rest. In fact, those of you taking notes, write this down. Here's what you need to do today. Follow my example. I'm going to go home, I'm going to eat lunch, and I'm going to bed to take a nap. And last Sunday, I lied to you. I didn't get my three-hour nap last Sunday. It will happen today, I promise you. <laughs> my phone will be turned off and left downstairs, and I'm going to take a nap. And after my nap, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to eat something good for dinner. And then this evening, I'm going back to bed. At a decent hour, I'm going to sleep some more. Go home, take a nap, get some good food, get a good night's rest, get up tomorrow, have a good breakfast, and be ready to go. We need, we have a needed recovery, and we have to step into that to get out of the cave of depression. Take care of yourself, and that brings you to step number two. Look what happened with Elijah, verse number nine. There he came to a cave where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now let me hit the pause button for a second. Anytime God asks a question, he's not asking because he doesn't know the answer. He's asking to make sure you know the answer. And he asks Elijah, what are you doing here? God knows why he's here. He wants Elijah to know why he's here. Verse 10, Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Verse 11, look at God's response. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. Elijah went to Mount Sinai. Some translations call this Mount Horeb. It's the place where God revealed himself to the people of Israel. And notice what happened. Elijah stepped into a God encounter. He fell asleep under the tree. God sent an angel to address his physical need, and then he stepped into a God encounter. God said, Elijah, I want to show you something. So Elijah stood on the mountain as God passed by. And notice scripture said, there was a mighty windstorm, there was an earthquake, and there was a fire. Each demonstration was to remind Elijah of God's tremendous power. But God's presence came in the sound of a gentle whisper. God's presence was in that gentle whisper. Chris Hodges says, God usually speaks to us in stillness and quietness. And God reminded Elijah that he was still right beside him. 
He says most of us want God to do something spectacular to rescue us when we're suffering, but God often would rather whisper to us. I was looking this morning for something online, and this is not what I was looking for, but what I found was somebody asked the question, what did God whisper to Elijah? No, we don't know the answer to that. And can I tell you, it doesn't matter. Maybe God just said, Elijah, I'm right here. Maybe he said, I am enough. I am God. See, we look for the dynamic, but God is often in the intimate. We look for the, the, the big movements of God. We want to feel all the goosebumps and all the tingles, but God's not always in that. that. He sometimes, most of the time, God's in the intimate moments. See, on Mount Carmel, God showed up for everyone else, but at Mount Sinai, God showed up for Elijah. God demonstrated his power on Mount Carmel by answering with fire when Elijah prayed. But on Mount Sinai, God was there in a gentle whisper. At Mount Carmel, God was spectacular to everyone. At Mount Sinai, God was special to Elijah. There's no substitute for the power and the presence of God. You can experience his power. You can experience his presence without anybody else being in the room. In fact, some have said the presence of God is the greatest antidepressant there is. Well, how does that help me? I can't get to church every day. You don't have to be in church to be in the presence of God. We must learn to cultivate the presence of God. The presence of God is very sweet and very precious. And to cultivate his presence... We must create environments where we can get close to God, where we can quiet our souls and make room for God. We must have those times where we just draw back and get along with God. Where am I going to do that? My kids are always around. Go for a drive. Go mow the lawn. Can't tell you how many times I've been out mowing the lawn just in the presence of God, enjoying his presence. Because here's what I love about that. You can call, but I can't hear you call because the mower's on. But you have to take your earbuds out and listen sometimes. You know, sometimes we could just be still and be quiet and we can experience God. Get alone with him. The psalmist says in Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. The stillness and the quietness and the intimacy of worship is found in me being still and letting God be God. What does it mean to be still? It's pretty simple. Just be still. But you know what I discovered? Sometimes I need to be still and be in a moment of silence in a quiet room. Sometimes I don't need music playing. I just need to be quiet in his presence. There are some days I come in to pray and I, and I, and I want to walk and, 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 and he never, I never hear it out loud, but sometimes in my, in my heart I hear if the, if the Lord is saying, son, just sit down and be quiet. And can I tell you, those are the most awkward moments at first when God says, sit down and be quiet, because I always felt like I needed to say something, and I want to say, oh, God, you're great, and I want to worship you. He's like, no, 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 just be quiet, be still. Be still. But other times, I come in and I want to play some music, and isn't it amazing? Sometimes you can play a song, and that song says exactly what you're feeling, that you didn't know how to put it into words. Sometimes, Those songs lift you up and they push you into God's presence. I heard it said this way, if you can't find God, just worship and he'll find you. Because remember what Jesus told the woman at the well? He said the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. I heard that and I was like, oh, that's so amazing. Because so many times we're like, God, where are you? And if we'll just get alone and worship God with our whole heart and spirit and in truth, he will find us. He will find us. In Psalm 73, Asaph was de- depressed and he was distressed about the prosperity of the wicked. And in Psalm 73, 16, he said, I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. And in verse 17, then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. There's something about going into his presence, getting along with him. We have a needed recovery. But we also need to have a God encounter. And then watch what happens next, 1 Kings 19, verse 13. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Notice, when Elijah heard the still, small voice, he, he covered his face. He wrapped his face in his cloak. Why did he do this? Maybe he did it in reverence to the presence of God. Maybe he did it because your face represents your identity. And maybe he was so down, he was embarrassed that he was there and ashamed of his identity. And God asked him the same question. What are you doing here? Elijah gives the same answer. What are you doing here, Elijah? Lord, I'm the only one left. I've been zealous for you. I've served you. I've been faithful to you. And I'm the only one left. Everyone else has rebelled and broken your covenants, but I have been strong and I've stayed true to you. And I'm the only one left and they want to kill me too. But that wasn't true. Elijah has lost his confidence. When did he lose his confidence? 1 Kings 19, verse 1. When Jezebel sent the message to Elijah, he lost his confidence. Elijah talked himself into believing a lie. And believing that lie caused him to have a flawed understanding of who he was and the reality around him. And sometimes we do the same thing. We buy into a narrative and an identity that the world says about us, and we've forgotten what God says about us. Do you know who you really are in God's eyes? You're not who the world says you are. You're who God says you are. And that's why we need to step into a true identity. What does God say about you? Do you know? Who does God say you are? He says you're loved. He says you're forgiven. He says you're healed. He says you're redeemed. He says you have a purpose. You can make a difference. You are a child of God. Say that. Say, I am a child of God. Oh, no, you can't, you can't, no, 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 no. You can't go, I'm a child of God. It's like, look, look, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I belong to him. He bought me with his son. He purchased me with the blood of his son, and I am his son. I'm a child of God, and nothing you say can take that away from me. Yeah, but you're not kidding. No, I'm a child of God. He simply loves me. Do you understand how incredibly amazing it is that God simply loves you? He knows what you've done, and he loves you. He knows what you're going to do, and he loves you. He loves you, period. Nothing you and I do can cause God to love us anymore. There's nothing else he could do but give Jesus. Nothing we do can cause God to love us less. He loves us. He loves us. An incorrect identity does the same thing in us that it did to Elijah. It makes us believe a narrative that's not true. Look at verse 13. When Elijah heard the voice, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? This is the second time God's asked that question. And here's Elijah's response. Can you hear it? Let me read it like this. He replied, I've been zealous and served the Lord Almighty. <laughs> but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn your altars down and killed every one of your prophets. And God, I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too and nobody cares. Doesn't your heart just go out to Elijah? He's having a pity party. He's lost his identity. He's forgotten he's a man of God. And he's believed a narrative. He's believed a lie that's not true. And it's distorted his view of himself and his view of God. We have to know who we are. Say it with me again. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Sometimes in your, in your walk with the Lord, sometimes in your daily life, in that still moment when you're getting alone with God and having that God encounter, sometimes you have to say, you know what? Shut up, devil. I'm a child of God. I'm not going to believe that lie. I know who I am. Because the enemy, he loves to throw stuff into your mind. He loves to say things, well, I thought God loved you. He does love me. Shut up, devil. Well, but remember that sin you did? I thought God forgave you. He did forgive me. It's covered by the blood. Shut up, devil. 
Well, I thought God was your healer. He is my healer. And you just shut up and I'm going to trust him and I'm going to know he's going to heal me. Well, I thought God would never leave you alone. Where's everybody at? Devil, shut up. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by my father and all of his holy angels. And I'm not alone. So just shut up, devil. Listen, I heard this great statement. Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Isn't that cool? Nobody can make you feel inferior unless you give them permission to do that. You can say what you want to say about me, but it doesn't make me feel any less of a man, any less of a child of God, unless I choose to allow that to make me feel less than I am. We have to decide, I'm not going to believe what people say about me. I'm going to believe what God says about me. We have a needed recovery. We need to take care of our bodies. We need to sleep right. We need to eat right. We need to step into a God encounter. We need to believe the truth about who we are. We're a child of God. And now watch how God responds. Verse 15. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Did God even hear what Elijah said? Twice the Lord said, what are you doing here? And twice Elijah said, Lord, everybody's bailed on you except me and I'm the only one left. God doesn't even address his complaints and his whining. Let me say that again. God doesn't even address his complaints and whining. So why do we complain and whine so much? God didn't answer Elijah. Is God going to answer us? I don't know. That's a different sermon. God said, go back the way you came. Go back the same way you came. In other words, turn around and go back and do what I told you to do. Turn around and go back the way you came. Now listen, the way he came, if you remember in the early part of chapter 19, he came through a, a town called Beersheba. And if you look up the name and the meaning of the town Beersheba, it means the place of the oath. And it's almost as if God is saying, Go back to the place of the oath. Go back to the place where I called you. Renew that commitment. Renew that calling. Renew that oath you made. And get back and do what I called you to do. Go back the way you came. You've forgotten your purpose. So go back to the place you committed to me and make a new commitment. Verse 15. The Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram, then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of abel Mehola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Oh yeah, and one more thing. Verse 18. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. In other words, one more thing, you're not alone. You're not alone. I didn't leave you alone. There are 7,000 others who haven't bowed down to Baal. You're not alone. You're a man of God. So get up and get back to work. And that brings us to our fourth step. We step into a new assignment. Step into a new assignment. Listen, secular psychology will tell you there's nothing more powerful than a project. If you wake up every day just paying bills, you're going to wind up in a cave of depression. But if you know that your life has purpose and meaning, that you're doing something that makes a difference for eternity, that gives you a new perspective. That's a whole other story. What are you doing that is adding value to someone's life for eternity? Well, I'll get up and I go to work. Okay. Did you realize at work where you work, that is your assignment? God has placed you there to be his hands and feet to those who are around you? You may be the only man or woman of God in that workplace, but probably not because there are always others. And God has placed you there to be Jesus' skin onto them. We have to understand the power of a project, the power of a purpose, the power of a dream. Scripture tells us in Proverbs 29, 18, the King James Version, where there is no vision, people perish. I like the New Living Translation. When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. So many people are running wild because there's no purpose for their life. What is your assignment? What is your purpose? Well, I thought it was this, but my time ran out and I did that and there's nothing else to do. And go back to where God called you, make a new commitment and step into your new assignment. It's what Viktor Frankl discovered with his logotherapy treatment. Viktor Frankl said, people have enough to live by, but nothing to live for. They have a means, but no meaning. 
And notice, God never does address Elijah's issues. He just reminds Elijah about his calling. Go back the way you came, and then he gave people influence. And what's really cool about this story, I think it's cool, is God gave him specific directions, but he didn't finish. He went and found Elisha, and Elisha anointed Hazael, and Elisha anointed Jehu. What God was trying to do was to get Elijah out of the cave and to go realize there's a new assignment. I'm not done yet. When we have a focused heart on a clear assignment, it helps ease the pain in the cave of depression. Look what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. He says, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed day by day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them all and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Stop focusing on the things that are temporary. Focus on the things that are eternal. What's your purpose? What's your purpose in being a part of this church? We want to help you discover that. That's why every month we offer Growth Track. Why do I got to go to Growth Track for? I've been in this church forever. Yeah, but you're not doing anything. Let me just help you. No one's purpose at Christian Center is to come on Sunday, sit in a chair, say amen a couple times, and go home and do nothing. We're the body of Christ. We all have a purpose. We all have a function. We've all got to be doing something. Well, I don't know if I could teach kids. Okay, can you smile and look friendly? Then be a greeter. I don't really like people. Okay, come to the cleaning team and put a vacuum in your hands or a broom in your hands. Brooms and vacuums are sometimes nicer than people. No matter what your personality is, there's something for you to do. You've got to find your purpose. That's why we want you to be a part of Growth Track. Do you have problems in your life? Yes. Is is serving somewhere going to take away your problems? No. You're still going to have problems. But the thing is, we got to have something in our life that's bigger than our problems. we got to realize, I may have problems, but I'm being a blessing to somebody else. In fact, if your problems are so big right now that you can't see how blessed you are, you need a volunteer to come Thursday night to Food Pantry Line. Not to hand out food. You need to show up and be here at 5.30 and tell Carrie, I would like to volunteer and I want to pray for people in line. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Just be Jesus with skin on. You're going to walk up and go, hey, thanks for coming tonight. Is there anything I can pray with you about? And you're going to hear people say, everything. I just need God to touch everything. And you just begin to pray from your heart. There's something incredibly empowering about praying for other people, praying for their burdens, praying for their needs, praying for their struggles. All of a sudden you realize, I don't have it so bad. And you realize I can add value to somebody by praying with them. Now, I didn't get permission to invite you Thursday night, but you can come. It'll be all right. We need to get healthy physically. We need to learn how to get along with God. We need to start looking at the needs of other people. We need to find a ministry where we're giving out. Here's the last step. 1 Kings 19, 19. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plying with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Here's the last step. Step into a relational strength. See, what's amazing is from this point on, Elijah never walked alone again. He didn't. You can read on about Elisha. And I was thinking about this because we read earlier in chapter 19 that Elijah's servant, he left him at Beersheba. But Elisha, when he starts following Elijah, he won't leave. In my mind, naturally went here. Who was that first guy? Scripture never tells us the name of that servant. But Scripture tells us that as Elijah anointed Elisha, Elisha never left him. He walked with him and he stayed with him. You can read on that the Lord's about to call Elijah home. And Elijah's like, Elisha, I got to go over here. Stay here. And he's like, nope, wherever you go, I'm going. He says, all right, come on. And he goes to another city. Elijah, Elisha, stay here. I got to go over here. Nope, wherever you go, I'm going. Elisha was the kind of servant, was the kind of friend that would not leave Elijah alone. Yeah. He never walked alone again. Listen, there are times you need to be alone, but most of the time we need people around us. Yeah, it's true. I talked to my friend last night, and she said, 
I love being at home by myself. It's like nothing wrong with that. But you can't always be at home by yourself because here's what happens. If you're always at home by yourself, you're in that cave and all of a sudden the depression starts slipping in because you're all alone by yourself. Yeah. And if you think, well, I'm exempt. I can be by myself. Here's your assignment. Go home and find a National Degree Geographic show that shows lions chasing gazelles and watch which gazelle the lion singles out to attack and to destroy. Yeah. It's always the one that gets off by themselves. The enemy lies and says, you're okay, you can be by yourself. That's a lie. Yeah. We need other people. Yeah. We need other people. Yeah. Sometimes we need people who can pray with us and pray for us. Sometimes we need people who can laugh with us. Sometimes we need people who can cry with us. And sometimes we need people who can just be in the room and their presence is encouraging. I learned a long time ago as a pastor, I'm going to get calls and people are going to lose loved ones. And any time, I remember being young and I even experienced it now, any time I walk into a room and there's a family who's grieving, in my head I'm thinking, oh dear God, what am I going to say? But you know what the Holy Spirit's taught me and what my mentors have taught me? Show up and shut up. Here's what, here's what I've learned. When people are at their lowest and they're grieving, they don't need you to speak wisdom. They just need you to be in the room. They just need you to be there and be a source of comfort, be a source of calming, be a source of hope. They just need to know that somebody cares and somebody's physically here. They need somebody with Jesus, as Jesus with skin on. We need each other. We talk about this a lot. And I know you probably get tired of hearing us say it, but we keep telling you, we've told you for years, we get to serve. We want you to serve. Listen, it's not because we're in such dire straits that there's no help and we need you to serve. We need you to serve because it's going to benefit you. There's something about coming together as a team. Why do I got to get up early on Saturday and mow the lawn? Because it's fun. Because when we come and we mow the lawn together as a team, we have fun together. I thought for sure some guys would give me an amen there. I've watched the cleaning team. They have fun. They're cleaning, but they're enjoying each other's company. I've gone home and they're cleaning the church and, I, and, I, and I've, the cameras have gone off and I've opened my phone and checked the camera and I'll notice in the foyer there's a group just standing around just enjoying each other's company. I always wonder, what are they talking about? It doesn't matter. In that moment, they needed each other. We need you to get plugged in. Be a part of a group. That's why we do breaking bread. We take, we've taken a break for the holidays, but when we fire back up and do breaking bread, you should be a part of breaking bread. You should go eat somewhere. Just say, I want to eat at this restaurant with a group of people I might or might not know because I need people. That's why we want you to be a part of the young adults group if you fit that, that category. We want you to be a part of the men's Zoom at 6 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. When we start a new group, we start new groups, not so we can have so many groups. We start new groups so that you can be a part of a group, something bigger than you. There's a statement I heard years ago. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me the kind of people you hang around with and I'll show you the kind of person you're going to become. And if you never hang around other people, I can tell you, you're going to be alone in a cave of depression. Make sure you're connecting to the right people. Chris Hodges in his book, he says, God builds his kingdom relationally. His design for our health and protection is centered on family and close friends who love us unconditionally and point us toward his truth. He says, God designed relationships to be the single greatest sustaining contributor to your health, happiness, and success. He says, we all need others to lean on, to learn from, and to laugh with. We all need others if we're going to grow. Relationships are essential for us to bloom. Did you hear that last statement he said? Relationships are essential for us to bloom. We always say, oh, bloom where you're planted. And yes, you should bloom where you're planted, but you need other people to help you bloom. And then Chris Hodges quotes Johan Hari. Johan Hari said, so often when people feel down in this culture, we say, just be yourself. He said, I realize actually what we should say to people is don't be yourself, be us, be we, be part of the group. We need each other. That's the reason you're in a cave of depression. You've gotten alone. You've gotten by yourself. And you need us to come alongside you and say, come on, let's walk out of this cave together. Let's walk out of here strong and healthy. Let's take some naps. Let's eat healthy. Let's drink lots of water. Let's get healthy physically. Let's learn to start meeting with God on a daily basis. Let's learn who we really are in Christ Jesus. Let's find our purpose and live with purpose. And let's do it with a group of friends. And every one of us will come out of that cave. But we got to take the first step. 
Would you stand with me this morning? God, thank you this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. As he said earlier, thank you for your mercies that are new this morning. Thank you, that, thank you for your grace that's so empowering, so energizing. And Lord, thank you for your presence. For the psalmist reminds us in your presence is fullness of joy. And thank you that in your presence, hope is rebirthed in our hearts. Peace comes to our hearts and our minds in your presence. Father, I pray over your sons and daughters who are here today. Some of them really are in this cave of depression. And they need you to help them take steps to get out of this cave. The Holy Spirit, I ask you to just tug at their hearts and do a work only you can do. But I ask you to help them to look up and to see that there is hope. Give them a glimpse of your perspective over their life and their situation. Things aren't as dark and dreary as they seem to be. They're just in a cave and they need to step out into the light. Step out into your presence and your life. They feel like they're surrounded. But Father, help them to see the problems they think have them surrounded. They don't really have them surrounded. You've got them and their problems surrounded and you're greater than anything that they face. And you will make a way. You are a God of hope. You're a God of peace. So Lord, this morning, we're just going to lift our voices and praise you and declare that the battle belongs to you. And God, help us this morning to take the word to heart and begin to take these steps. There are those here this morning, they've put themselves alone. Send them the right person who can be a brother or a sister who can walk beside them and stand beside them. Take them by the arm and help them take a step towards the light. God, do a work in us today. Set us free today. Help us to be healthy today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a video or a live stream. And please share this video with your friends and family. If this message has encouraged you today, please let us know in the comments as we would love to connect with you. And thank you so much for your generosity. Because of you and your faithful giving, together we share the gospel around the world. So please visit our website, crumbcc.church and use the giving link. God bless you. We can't wait to worship with you again next week.